moment here to swap some presentations. some help here. Okay, I got it. I got it. Thanks. Yep. Okay. So, before we get started on the next one, this is the last keynote of the, uh, for the day, and I believe for the conference as well, then we get into the rapid uh, sessions for uh, with each and every category. So the next speaker is Dave Ward from Cisco. Uh, Dave is also a well-known entity in, in the industry as well as here at this particular conference. Um, he's, be, he's the CTO of engineering and the chief architect in Cisco. He's also, he was a Cisco fellow, he is a Cisco fellow. Uh, he's been with Cisco for the last, um, for at least 11 years, I believe. During, uh, there was a period of two years where he did a stint with Juniper as a Juniper fellow as well. Um, Dave has this unique capability to explain uh, technology to a non-technical audience. I've been very impressed by his uh, capabilities. He's, um, I know I've known him for more than 10 years, and uh, he's, he has many, many, many technical accomplishments, including you know, hundreds of patents, many, many RFCs, and he's actually the, the routing AD as well as the chair of four different working groups simultaneously, right Dave? Yep. Um, most recently, he's been shepherding Cisco's engineering strategy, and for those of you who don't know Dave, um, you might want to ask him later on, but he never presents with his shoes on, so I don't know if it's superstition or it's comfort, but that's Dave Ward for you. Welcome, Dave. Good morning, everybody. So. Uh, as I begin my talk, uh, there go the shoes. Um, so as I begin my talk, uh, what I would like to talk to you about today is not necessarily a low-level component of what can be done in cloud computing, nor do I want to focus solely on the data center or cloud itself, but instead I want to talk about bringing together an architectural view of what programmatic interfaces and orchestration blended with MPLS and what those new solutions can bring to the industry. And so let me proceed. Don't touch the computer. Thanks, Cesar. Perfect. So I was so happy that uh, nobody else before me before the keynote decided to take MPLS and SDN and blend them together and talk about MPLS at the end. So that's, again, what I'd like to talk about today. So as we know, uh, the industry is changing. I'm going to go through this quickly. Things are rapidly emerging such that the key thing that we need to solve is make everything go faster and make it more flexible and agile to enable all of the new devices coming onto the internet and all the new services we need to be able to provide uh, absolutely go faster. But what's interesting is when we take a look at MPLS, and I too have been talking to a number of folks, uh, it's well known. It's, it's been deployed for well over 10 years. It's very mature. It's, of course, standardized, as previous speakers were mentioned. Um, it's got operational experience, but yet what I want to talk about next are some of the per perceived challenges, is that it's very, very complex to deploy. And in fact, in being an advocate for MPLS you know, over many, many years, I've actually found some challenges in certain parts of the, the segment of the marketplace in which they be it's believed that the operational overhead is actually too complex for some IT pro professionals. Now, I know what conference I'm at, so I know that not everybody in this room would believe that, 
but nonetheless, many operators actually do find it too complex. But there's also a couple of other uh, pieces that are critical to, uh, to understand on a couple of inefficiencies that are there today. We have non-deterministic placement of load on the network and non-deterministic -deter engineering of bandwidth across the wide area network. And really what I'm describing here is the lack of call admission control with MPLS. And also that what we can understand from the current VPN marketplace is that the, the traditional VPN marketplace as we know, whether it's L2 VPNs or L3 VPNs, the service velocity associated with the service offerings to those VPN customers appears to be limited. But we know that there's a number of changes that, it, that are occurring right now in the industry that we can take advantage of. And some of those are, of course, programmable interfaces and orchestration. But it's also, as was discussed by earlier keynotes, the ability to deliver cloud-based networking services. And that's what I'm gonna focus a bit on today. And then last, as much as I love donuts, I love croissants even more. And what I love about croissants are the different layers that uh, exist within that pastry and they're, they're just quite delicious. So I'm gonna talk about how to blend these different layers together and be able to come up with a much more optimal design for networking in this architecture. So as I move forward, again, the primary motivations that I'm trying to, trying to describe and the primary goals that I'd like to achieve is how to achieve faster service delivery and of course, how to enable the network resources and network services to be enabled as fast as IT operators can go. So make network operators be able to be enabled as, to go as fast as system administrators and as fast as developers can, can develop these new services for the network. So to be able to accomplish this, really with respect to MPLS defined networks, we have to be able to realize that it's an embracement of both programmability, orchestration, and virtualized network services based in the cloud. That logically centralized control, and, and you're gonna hear from my talk that it's not an either or, it's certainly not a versus as Yaakov was describing. Although we concluded with it's a healthy blend of both, I firmly believe that. In no stretch of the imagination am I gonna describe a divergence from the existing dynamic, dynamically routed control plane. It's a critical part of how we accomplish protection and restoration is a critical part of how we learn the topology around. But if we blend this together with a view of the entire topology, we can blend together WAN orchestration with cloud orchestration to deliver new services and deliver them faster. The pain points that we're trying to get at, of course, is leverage the proven concepts. Leverage, leverage the proven concepts that we know from both MPLS as well as optical transport, realizing that we have to be able to deploy this on existing platforms, that we need to be able to have a simplified control plane to enable a more scalable data plane. And then last, that notion of admission control and solving that head-end optimization problem or head-end sub-optimization problem that we currently see in the network when looking at Metro Ethernet or looking at other type of delivery from the head end towards the network by taking a view of the entire topology. So again, now what I'd like to walk you through, not only is this architecture and this blending together of these pieces, but walk you through some specific solutions. So we aren't talking about software defined networking for the sake of it, and we're not talking about specific programmatic interfaces or protocols for the sake of it, but what can we build with this technology altogether? And so I'm gonna walk you through these examples here. Realizing that it's blending all of these pieces together with what's being discussed or described as network function virtualization, which is the rise of virtual appliances as the key piece of, of pulling these together. So first, let me describe the overall architecture and how these pieces come together. We need to realize that to deliver end-to-end -end services, it's not just a conversation about the data center, and it's not just a conversation about the WAN or about an edge router. It's being able to orchestrate across that data center and WAN boundary extremely efficiently and tie together those VPN services directly into those particular uh, virtualized containers within a data center. Also, moving towards the, the bottom of this slide, we have to realize that 
traffic as w has been described many, many times in conferences like this and at this conference, traffic is now at such a high percentage of, of being transported over IP that we should no longer continue to optimize the transport network for transport circuits, but optimize that transport delivery for IP-based services. And so that's really the blending of the, of the multi-layer optimization between IP and optical. Last um, that I'd like to talk about in this slide, really it's a simplification of what we're, and what we're calling segment routing, and a colleague of mine will be discussing this uh, over the next couple of days, of how to remove the state from the MPLS network and how to reduce operational overhead, again, through segment routing. So moving forward in each of these different areas and describing different ways that the combinations of this technology can increase value is really here talking about blending together IP and transport to optimize for IP. And this is really where the greatest benefits actually come into play. We need to realize to optimize the transport circuits to deliver IP, we need visibility of the load and the characteristics at the IP layer in the transport layer, and we need to know the, the, the topology of the transport layer at IP, and it's an, it's an optimization of those two different layers of the network. But what we also realize practically and pragmatically is that um, the interface between transport layer and IP layer, um, there's a segmentation currently in many administrative domains, as well as um, different buying centers, et cetera, associated with these, with this different equipment. And so a clear demarcation between the two in which there's a request reply for the different circuits and creating a uni-type interface between these uh, absolutely right now appears to be the way to go. Trying to optimize the two together into one single graph across one single optimization algorithm um, appears potentially to not be the way in which we can get the greatest amount, or amount of multi-vendor uh, networks deployed, as well as an exchange between existing legacy transport networks and as this moves forward via GMPLS. So again, the point here, by being able to, to, to program and have visibility of both the transport layer, or optical layer, and the IP layer at the same time in a logically centralized view allows us to optimize that transport network for IP transport. The next piece I want to carry, and moving this up, up the stack a little bit, is focusing directly on VPN-based services. And the way I describe this is that VPN services today are generally characterized by giving, IP, giving e internet access to a particular business entity or bricks and mortar uh, branch, for example, in an enterprise. And once that configuration of that VPN is established in that config file, these rarely change. And what we get via programmatic interfaces is in fact the ability to deliver to those VPN customers cloud-based network services because we can program each one of those VPN customers independently and we can program those, di those different features and service and, and traffic diversion independently on a customer by customer basis versus using the traditional mechanism of CLI and config files. I say it this way because the desired state today of a service provider's VPN business, from a computer science point of view, that distributed database has been distributed to tens of thousands of edge devices in very small text files called the config file. That's one way to run a database, but other ways to run databases by being able to have a notion of service templating and the ability to have uh, download these particular services directly to the VPN customers, potentially via a portal access, which I'll describe shortly, is a much more rapid way to be able to deploy additional VPN services beyond just basic connectivity directly into virtualized appliances that exist in the cloud. And so moving this forward, we can also take other concepts that we know from MPLS TP as an example, and we discussed that at great length um, over the last several years, and realize that we can additionally provide transport-based services, which should be obvious to all, over MPLS and utilize all of statistical multiplexing by not using a separate transport container. And so we can see dramatic cost savings, which I'll describe to you in a few slides, by using MPLS and MPLS pseudowires, as you see on this particular slide, with bidirectional pseudowires, 
with the OAM capabilities and utilize all the, all the capabilities of those routers and the capabilities of that network by using MPLS as this transport container. Now moving this, forwards towards, moving this forward towards a simplification of the MPLS architecture and the MPLS system in general is through segment routing. And as you're reading this slide behind me, um, what I'd like to call out are a few things. First, some of those greatest operational challenges are imposed by our use of a couple of signaling protocols, RSVP and LDP. I know the audience I'm talking to. To us, this is our bread and butter. We work with these protocols every day. We don't necessarily find them overly complex. But nonetheless, in large-scale operational environments and in IT departments, I am getting the feedback that, in fact, if we can remove this state, if we can remove these protocols from the network, in fact, if we can simplify the deployment of MPLS, but yet preserve the, the MPLS features, of course, a fast reroute of bandwidth engineering, of being able to create uh, disjoint networks for, for full repair, et cetera, that would be a benefit. And what I'm describing to you in segment routing is really removing RSVP and LDP by passing around labels in the IGP themselves. And by being able to do this, we realize with the addition of a full visibility of the network topology itself and being able to dynamically program the head end at the edge devices of either a TE tunnel or a, a tunnel in this particular case or of a VPN, we can dramatically simplify the operations of the MPLS architecture in the network and also remove dramatic amounts of state out of the network itself. So the combination of, again, removing state from the network with the view of the entire topology and being able to program paths preserves for us all of the attributes that we desire out of MPLS but don't require that complexity and overhead as well as potentially delays. What we see here with this particular, with the, with the notion of the WAN controller is that we can also be able to control not only which path is going forward but we can also control which particular service topology we write upon by having, having uh, all of these labels distributed to the IGP. So let me get to the point here about what is a WAN controller. A WAN controller is not, again, is not a single entity that suddenly replaces all of dynamic routing. Instead, it is a logically distributed software entity that enables us to have a full view of the topology, as well as being able to control multiple layers at one time. And this becomes a critical piece to be able to solve the lack of admission control in MPLS networks. So let me give you an analogy. When, you're, when you start off for the day and figure out how you're gonna get into work, if you make the decision as you're leaving your house based upon what you know, you will choose the normal path that you always take. Perhaps, Perhaps uh, you listened to the radio and you understood that the path that you normally take, there's been an accident or there's some construction on that particular path and so you take a, another one. But all your neighbors also took all that secondary path. So again, you're on that congested link. If you have the view of the entire topology, you can realize that you can suddenly take, you have multiple forks of different paths that you can take, but you can only see that if you take a view other than from the head end of where you're gonna start your, your drive into work. And so, Adding into the network the ability to program the edge devices and program the WAN devices or the core devices across in conjunction with dynamic routing becomes the key. So now I want to tie this together and we've heard a couple of talks about um, the use of SDN in the cloud. But I want to take a slightly different architectural tack at this one and, as you, and what I'd like to describe here, as you can see on the far side, one of the fundamental issues we have in building data centers today, and this wasn't called out earlier, is that we build data centers even for providing network-based services to, to VPN customers by attempting to hide the data center from that VPN, from participating in that VPN. And we do this by, at the data center WAN gateway router, taking the customer's VPN route, VPN, and translating this potentially into a separate and distinct internal VPN inside the data center. Again, hiding the fact that they're having a tenancy or a cloud-based presence by that VPN customer in the data center itself. 
this causes all sorts of operational overhead. And this causes operational overhead not only in trying to handle the back-to-back -back VRFs that potentially could be handled, but when you start bringing in multi physical appliances into this, like firewalls or load balancers, you then in inside those devices need to create those as being multi-tenant as well. And now you have a massive multi-segment routing problem. There's a couple of different solutions to this. One was discussed uh, just previously with respect to the, the donut model, but in fact there's two, and I'm not really religious about either one of them. I think they're both applicable depending upon the situation you're in. The one in the middle here really is terminate the VRF on the data center WAN gateway router and create a virtual CE inside the data center itself, creating the, the tenant zones behind it. This would be akin to creating a PE to CE link inside a data center. This is available today. You can spin this up today, and it scales according to this, the number of VRFs that that particular data center WAN gateway router or gateway routers can hold. What was just described in the donut model, in fact, is taking that VPN potentially all the way to into a, a virtual PE, either running in a hypervisor or running on the top of rack switch. Both models are, are directly applicable depending upon uh, which particular service you need to be able to work towards. The one in the center allows you to work immediately, allows you to scale, uh, again, to the size of the VRF tables on those data center WAN gateway routers, but can be spun up extremely quickly as a, as a virtual CE is just another image to be spun up by your cloud orchestration system. And the virtual PE model allows you to scale massively because you're, you're taking all those VRF tables all the, way, all the way potentially into the hypervisor or onto uh, bare metal or onto the tour itself. But the main thing is take our MPLS architecture that we know, whether it's creating PE to CE links or whether it's distributing the VRF all the way uh, into the hypervisor as the architecture to move forward with versus attempting to hide the, the data center from the, from the VPN customer and from the tenant itself. And so these become critical changes as we rethink exactly how to build our data center architectures. This effectively becomes in, in, from a cloud offering, the notion of routing as a service. What hasn't been discussed yet, though, um, or hasn't been discussed in detail, I'd just like to pause here for a moment and talk about this cross-domain orchestration piece. Because when you focus just on conversations about data centers, you really miss that you must tie this to, if you're providing, if you're trying to provide virtual tenancy for, for a VPN customer, you must provide a tie to the WAN. If you're providing this uh, network, cl sorry, cloud-based networking services to a mobile gateway, you need to be able to engineer the network in between that gateway and the cloud. And what I've been focusing on recently is, in fact, this particular tie between the cloud orchestration piece and, say, the virtual enterprise uh, VPN tenancy or these network services and how to orchestrate across, across the WAN. So if you take the first part of this presentation and talk about WAN orchestration, and multi-layer orchestration, and you tie it into your cloud orchestration, those together give you the full end-to-end -end service that we're trying to deliver. So what I'd like to compare and contrast just for a second today, when using the cloud to provide network services, really, as you can see in the central column, if we're trying to uh, spin up a new particular service, we potentially have to buy that hardware, we have to rack it up, we have to install the image, install the hardware in the data center, et cetera, et cetera. But really what can move forward with the notion of programmatic interfaces orchestration and the inclusion of NFV in this architecture, the virtualization of network services, is effectively a customer goes to a portal, it instantiates that service template, we connect this together uh, across that data center WAN gateway and across the WAN, and the service is dynamically started. The second one is to be able to increase capacity. And as we know, increasing service capacity, again, whether you're delivering this from, say, a video cache or if you need to provide additional web services, as the case might be, there's a set of, of constraints that you need to meet, as you can see in this middle column here. You, first, you have to see that you have the, the capacity threshold has been reached, again, buy the hardware, install the hardware, et cetera. But it is now possible, actually, to have elastic service control inside that cloud, which not only monitors the network service based in the hypervisor, not, not only manages the load within the data center, but manages the load coming in from the WAN. 
and then can orchestrate and dynamically dilate the bandwidth not only across the WAN, but dilate the capacity going into the data center and dilate the capacity also on, on load balancers as well as the service that's being delivered. And so this key piece of being able to get real-time statistics not only out of the WAN, but also out of the cloud will deliver and meet the, the service assurance and service levels associated with end-to-end -end services. So bringing this together a little bit, with this faster velocity, as you can see, sorry, as you can see here, and let me, let me just uh, build this out for you. If we look at the state machine, when we want to actually fire up network services in the data center, we can place those in the data center, we can create an overlay tunnel using, this, using the WAN orchestration, and then we can begin to divert traffic off of that edge router. And now that VPN customer has direct access end-to-end -end with service assurance for the network functions that have been virtualized in that cloud. And these steps are certainly possible if you combine all of these technologies together. So let me show you a direct example that's, uh, that's currently being, being worked through. Imagine your data centers throughout Europe. You have a portal in which you can take a look at the state of the cloud to understand what versions and images are possible in that cloud. You then can take a look at what um, the state of those particular services. And in small font here, it just says a networking service of DNS, but it could say firewall, it could say intrusion detection, it could say NAT. You then can take actions upon that service, and frankly, you have a self-service portal to be able to give an enterprise VPN customer whatever they want out of that cloud and have it fully orchestrated end-to-end -end from that PE router to those virtualized network functions. So let me dial this back for a second and, and, and uh, begin to summarize this talk. With faster, we get faster service velocity by combining both WAN orchestration with that cross-domain orchestration into the cloud and using virtual appliances in conjunction with physical appliances to be able to deliver the service faster, make everything go faster, make it more efficient, tune the transport network to the IP layer where most of the traffic is currently being passed. Next, make it more deterministic, add a notion of, of load control, add a notion of call admission control into the MPLS system, which can be done by understanding the entire state of the WAN topology through a WAN orchestration element. And then make it simpler and improve the scale of MPLS. And do this by removing the state out of the network and potentially removing some of the protocols out of the network itself. Quickly, when you begin to tune your network to take a look at how you can optimize the transport layer towards delivering IP, and then how you can optimize your, your L2 VPN uh, traffic, as I described earlier with Flex LSP, to where you have bandwidth across your topology, it's reasonable to get tens of percent of efficiency out of the network itself. Now, what's interesting, when you get this efficiency out of the network and you combine this with faster service delivery, you're not going to see necessarily a reduction in the actual amount of traffic on the network. You actually might see an increase because you have all sorts of new load sources. But as you have new load sources coming into the network from these cloud-based services, this optimization becomes critical for you to, again, contain that cost as you're now much more rapidly delivering these services. So as we build this out with all the pieces that I mentioned and all the different layers of this croissant that uh, we want to be able to dive into, we have a notion of being able to work across layers with IP plus optical and tuning towards IP-centric services tune those business VPN services, orchestrate them across the WAN, deliver uh, network function virtualization, and deliver end-to-end -end cloud-based services tied in conjunction to the service level agreement and service assurance that needs to occur end-to-end -end across that system and make it available to, to the application developers. Make it go faster. Make NetOps go faster. Make it easier such that network is being operated upon and being manipulated as fast as system administrators can spin up those hypervisors for those new services and as fast as those developers can, can code them. Get these networking attributes available to the developers. So that way the workload that they want to put on into the cloud, those requirements of that workload, delay, load, bandwidth, jitter, packet loss, et cetera, now can be monitored in real time and can be acted upon as those workloads are being spun up. 
And so I do actually believe that the integration of programmatic interfaces and orchestration into an MPLS architecture is what we're going to be discussing over the next 10 years and discussing more and more solutions as they, as they come forward. So thank you very much for your time today. Since we have a break next, maybe I'll take a couple of questions if, if anybody has questions for Dave. No? So thank you very much, Dave. Thank you all. So um, just before you run off for break, I believe we saw five different perspectives from five different vendors, Ericsson, Huawei, Cisco, Juniper, and um, Alcatel-Lucent. And uh, I believe uh, that ends all of our keynotes. And we'll take a break now and come back with, uh, with the session on OpenFlow and MPLS when we have three presenters there. Uh, let's come back at the allotted time, which is 11.40.